like to to start in a uh, informal way, you know. Um, I don't like to start saying, uh, here we are, welcome everybody, okay? Mm. Um, I, I like to use this, um, this moment like a, a conversation, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, in, in, this, in this particular uh, interview, I'm really uh, interested in so much things that I think 30 minutes will be not enough. But um, I will ask you um, the most important things to, to me. And uh, actually, it's it's very interesting to having you here now because you know you uh, you start as a, um, a solution focused therapist. You know, I uh, quite inside in brief therapies. I study solution focused, but also strategic therapy, Ericsson therapy, and, uh, and so on. And then. Um, you, you continue with feedback informant treatment and then uh, deliberate practice. So, um, this is also a little disturbing, you know, because uh, it needs to have a change of mindset, which is, um, it's disturbing. I'm chasing you since I don't know, three or four years. Uh, maybe you remember that I told you uh, three or four times, I'm coming to Chicago, this is the here, I'm coming, I'm coming. Mm. And, uh, mm. and it was a, a resistance of mine, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have time to talk about that. Um, before that, let's say, um, could you please give to me and to the audience um, uh, an idea about feedback, informed treatment and uh, deliberate practice in a nutshell. I, I'm asking you so much, but mm. can you do this for me? Sure. Feedback informed treatment emerged out of research findings which showed that it didn't matter which model of treatment you practiced. We all ended up with about the same outcomes as a field. As you've mentioned, I was part of the Brief Family Therapy Center in Milwaukee and Solution Focused Therapy. And one reason that the team split was because our research came back and it said that we were no more effective than anyone else. So why do solution focused if it doesn't help you become more effective than you were before? And so a pragmatic decision was made, which was maybe we can't figure out how therapy works, but we could certainly find out if it was working for this person or not. And there was other data that showed that therapists were not particularly good at knowing when their clients were going to drop out or when they were going to stay but not experience benefit or even when the clients were getting worse. They, they all were very confident that they could, but the research said something else. And so measuring and monitoring our outcomes and the client's engagement with us was a pragmatic solution to those problems. Okay, I don't know what to say with regard to how to work. I don't know the best model, but I can certainly teach you a way that you could find out if you were helping a particular client in your practice or not. That's feedback informed care. And we simply picked up on two key research findings. If, if we're gonna monitor, well then what should we measure? What should we look at? And there were two ideas. The first one was the outcome, of course. And we chose as the outcome a measure of well being or functioning. And the reason we chose that was because people's sense of well being is what predicts best when they decide, I need help. And it also predicts fairly well when the client decides, I've had enough help as opposed to symptoms or other constructs that are popular in therapeutic circles about what's causing the distress that people have. So the one thing we thought about measuring was 
those results in terms of well-being or distress. The second item we thought, which was common across therapeutic traditions, was the quality of the relationship. And we thought that was a good thing to monitor and measure since relationship from the client's point of view predicted their engagement in the care, how active they were, how interested they were, how participatory they were, which research showed was a very good predictor of outcome. So we just settled on those two variables. Well, is the person changing? And are they engaged with me in the, in the care process? I measure and monitor each visit and I would have discussions with, with the clients about that. And we were doing that for some time, actually, before there was any research support for it. Theoretically, it all made sense. And then the first studies started coming out by a former professor of mine, Michael Lambert, that suggested that when therapists had access to such data, that the outcomes improved, in particular when we were off track, when we weren't making progress, or when we weren't aligned with the client properly. If the therapist could become informed about that, then the outcomes tended to improve. So that's fit. And again, born out of a pragmatic experience that was, we can't figure out the right way to work and teach people so that it leads to better outcomes. It was, it's, that still surprisingly is a very controversial notion. And we've never said, I've never said, don't learn a, an approach. I, I've, I've never said that, although people routinely misunderstand it. What I say about fit is that it is agnostic with regard to treatment method. Somebody says, well, I do CBT. Is that okay? I say, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I don't care if you do CBT, ACT, whatever. T is currently popular. It's fine with me. As long as the client wants to drink it. If they don't want to drink in it, and, and if they don't find it nourishing, well, then time for a new T. Otherwise, we risk dropout or lack of change. Now, here's what happens when we begin monitoring and measuring. So I, for me, at least, I've simply, and I feel very lucky about this, I've simply followed where the data has pointed. So initially, our data said, Solution focused is fine, but it didn't do what I wanted, which was make me more effective. So I had to leave. I had to, I had to leave that behind in the same way that I left behind kindergarten. I, I, don't, I don't think of kindergarten as a bad experience. I don't think it was unuseful. It just, I have to move beyond that. So when we start monitoring and measuring, we end up with another dilemma. And that dilemma is that certain therapists in our samples rose to the top like cream on top of milk. And this was a very puzzling finding. We weren't the first to notice it. The field has known this for decades and absolutely ignored it. It's something that every therapist knows. They know that that therapist over there is amazing. I'm not as good as that. We, we all know this. I know this. But we've avoided it. And we've pretended as if if you practice this model, we'll all be equally effective. Well, that's nonsense. And the data says it's nonsense. But no one could explain it. In 2010, Okishi, together with Lambert and others, published another study. This is a massive study monitoring outcomes of therapists. And once again, they find certain therapists are better than others. And they end the article saying, it's a mystery as to why. And we saw this, I thought initially, to be honest, I thought this, some therapists rising to the top, I thought it was randomness. I thought just like stocks in the stock market next year, it will go down or up and predicting who was better. It was a fool's errand. I thought, well, I was wrong year after year. The same therapists were at the top and it didn't matter who they saw, what type of problems they had or seemingly so. And again, we were, we were lost. I was lost and I was on an airplane 
And I reached in the pocket in front of me. I'm often on airplanes pre-pandemic. And there was an article in a magazine that I never read. I've, I've never even looked at this magazine. It's called Fortune Magazine. It's a money magazine. So this is how bored I was on the airplane. I'd read a, a, a magazine about money and investing. And in there, there was an article by, uh, by the editor, Jeff Colvin, about a guy named Anders Ericsson. I'd never heard of Anders Ericsson. And what's weird about that is I lived in Sweden, the country he's from, for many for many years. I speak the language. My heritage is Scandinavian. And he he now lives in the United States. I never heard of him. And he's a psychologist. I never heard of him. That's because he'd never been cited by any psychotherapist in the history of our field. What is Erickson about? Erickson has been focused his entire career on why some people within a particular performance domain like chess or music or computer programming or surgery, why some rise to the top and everyone else stays the same or worse. And he had an explanation for that. Deliberate practice. Some performers within each performance domain spend more time pushing at the edge of their performance, pushing themselves to move just beyond what they're currently capable of doing. And he'd outlined the specific things that people needed to do, performers needed to do, to, to move their performance forward. He also pointed out that most people do not do that across professions. And it, it was a really disturbing thing to hear him say, most of us devote our entire li lives to our careers, and we are no better at it at the end than we are at the beginning. He says, that's astonishing, really. Now, the puzzle is all of us think we're better. But Erickson said, when you actually look at the results, like driving, for example, we're not better drivers than we were when we first started, Erickson said. We're not better walkers. That's actually his famous quote. He says, just because you've been walking for 55 years doesn't mean you get better at it day by day. He said, what you, what you get is more confident because the terrain doesn't change and you don't push your performance to the next level. You want to see how good of a walker you are, go trek an alpine path. Don't walk from your home to your office every day. You know, it, it just makes sense. Reading that article that day was like a religious experience. It was like, oh my God, you know, how could we have missed this? I didn't even know it. And why didn't I know about Erickson? Most of his material had been published in dry academic journals and speaking to a very small clique of people that uh, were interested in expertise, like Olympic athletes, top performing musicians or actors, but nobody had ever asked. So being of Swedish descent and speaking the language, I called him on the phone. He answers the phone and uh, he really helped the team and I figure out how we could investigate this in psychotherapy. So my point here is, is that all of this has been sort of a natural progression of, well, wait a minute, solution focus doesn't make me better. So it's not about the method. Maybe I should measure, then at least I know who I'm helping. Well, wait a minute, some are more effective than others. How can I explain that? Because it's not the model they're using. I've been down that route. So it must be something else, a serendipitous event chance event. I see this article and suddenly there is a door open that hadn't been opened previously. And that is deliberate practice, focused attention and practice at the edge of your performance designed to help you reach for objectives just beyond your current ability. And of course, as you know, Daryl Chow, who published the first study of deliberate practice in the history of psychotherapy, found that the more effective a therapist was, the more time they spent in deliberate practice. Two and a half times more than therapists with average effectiveness, 14 times more than therapists who were the least effective in the sample. And what's really curious is, you ask the therapists themselves, how effective are you? The least effective say they are just as effective as the most effective. 
no wonder we can't get better if we all think we're 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 as good as the best kind of crazy making really so that's fit and deliberate practice but making me cry you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I, I, I'm almost 40. Uh, uh, I, I told you I study uh, young, young therapy, and I know it's, it's strategic therapy, but no, it's single session therapy, solution focused on that. But as you say, um, you're not saying that uh, don't, we have not to study uh, a method, because as you say, the methods, the approach gives you the structure, you know? You're saying, if, if you understood, if you were if you want to improve, you have one to uh, monitor your 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 outcomes and your mm. progress, and two um, be engaged in uh, deliberate practice, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, um, um, you remind me um, what Freud, Sigmund Freud, said when he came in the USA. Uh, you know that he said um, with uh, Carl Jung and Sandor Franks on the ship. He said mm. they don't know we are bringing them the plague no you know mm. for, for the first cycle of um uh, psychotherapy uh, psychoanalysis in um, in usa uh, mm. well it's not the right time to talk about plague but um i hope mm. the listeners will forgive me uh, mm. because um what you and people um engaged in um, fit and in rome um, um, are, are saying it's something that we have to change our mindset. First of all, we have to change the, um, the faith. You, your article you sent me, very interesting, is uh, the title is something like uh, Losing the Faith, no? and you explain this kind of things. And so what's, what are the um, implementation issues? What are the um, greatest difficulties you are um, you and people in the field are uh, facing in trying to uh, help therapists to implement uh, fit and uh, deliberate practice mm -hmm. uh, at, at each turn in this developmental path I, I have been reminded of and embarrassed by my naivete that solution focused would somehow lead to better outcomes that monitoring was the end that that we needed the end thing we needed to do and i honestly thought that when we started to see the results of monitoring and deliberate practice that on hearing this people would say oh yeah of course very naive naive at multiple levels that ideas change people and they don't context changes and people catch up to the changing context demands change and people catch up to the demands and more there is a it is a big leap from my model is what informs my work Two, I need to push my performance if I want to get better. It's a, it's a huge leap. So what is the biggest barrier? Time. Time. Semmelweis, you'll, you'll remember, remember, had a realization 150 years ago that the women dying in the Austrian hospitals during childbirth probably weren't dying from the popular theory of the day, the medical theory of the day, the one supported by the medical establishment that there was an, a, a dangerous, invisible, poisonous gas called a miasma that wafted into the wards and caused everyone to fall sick. So that was the science of the day. That's what people were trained to do. And what did Semmelweis find out? Well, he made the connection between physicians doing autopsies and then helping women give birth without having washed their hands. And he comes up with what seems like a simple idea that if you washed your hands, the women stopped dying. And in fact, when he did that, when he instituted that policy, 
the death rate plummeted. What happened? Well, you know what happened. He was basically driven out of the country and put into an insane asylum. It, it was He was so crazy. Now, maybe he was too passionate an advocate, but nowadays no one would say, eh, hand washing, silly. When I go to see my dentist or my physician, if they don't wash their hands in front of me, I tell them to wash their hands. That's how, that's how this has changed. But as you know, if you visited any restroom and watched people after they use the, the, use the toilet, many don't. I watch them walk right by me and out and I think, oh my God, you know, they're touching the door. Ah, you know, I'm not afraid of germs. I'm afraid of ignorance and what that leads to. And yet it takes huge amounts of time. So 200, 150, 200 years post Semmelweis, we still have hand washing issues. In many hospitals, the failure of the medical staff to wash their hands, hygiene failures, are one of the leading causes of death. How could that be? These are educated professionals. Well, the context doesn't demand it. What, what did they do? John Provost at John Hopkins he decides to empower the other health professionals. If they see the physicians walk into a room without washing their hands, he said, it's okay for the nursing staff, whoa, somebody that is considered less having less power, to speak up and say, doctor, please wash your hands. What happens when he did it? Plummeted. That's fit. That's fit. That's us saying, hey, you have to do something about this. Why would that be so hard with our patients? Well, I think it's hard to get feedback. I think it's hard to change our minds. We rationalize away the reasons. You know, I didn't touch anything. Why do I need to wash my hands? I didn't pee on my hands. Why do I need to wash them after after I've used the, the toilet? So there needs to be a feedback process, but this takes time. And the data indicate, we actually have a study about this, that it takes between three and five years for people to make the shift to a feedback informed mindset. And there are two, seems as though there are two primary barriers. The first one is trust. Meaning, do I trust this data from my client more than I trust myself? Now I've framed that of course, in terms of doing therapy, but think of the person leaving the toilet. It's the same thing that somehow or other they trust themselves more than the science. You know, you should wash your hands, but you're not making that decision because you think it's okay. The second key barrier are structural barriers, institutional barriers. So in the countries that I visit and the places I consult, if a therapy is not working, at some point it makes sense for the treater to say, maybe it's a good idea for you to see somebody else or go to another program but there are often barriers in place about that. Historically, therapists tend to view such requests as indicative of client pathology. The fact that you want to leave right now is an indication that you're trying to escape my influence and sabotage your progress. These kinds of thoughts and the structural barriers, which also include, wait a minute, we have a huge waiting list. So if we end here, there might not be another therapist to see for six to eight weeks, maybe longer. Those barriers need to be addressed. Otherwise, therapists just don't make the referral. So two things again, trusting what the data say and learning to work with that data. And then secondly, dealing with institutional barriers to acting on client feedback. In the studies that we have where FIT or feedback informed treatment has not worked, two issues come up again and again. The first one is early stage of implementation. They give people six hours of training and then they monitor for six months and then do the results. What do they find? Fit makes no difference. Why? As I've said, it seems to take time to trust the data. The second studies, for example, a study with people who have eating disorders by Annika Davidson found that fit also didn't work 
but the staff were prohibited from acting on client feedback. Well, having a stopwatch doesn't make you run faster. Monitoring and measuring is not going to make you more effective. You've got to monitor, hear the feedback, and act, of course, on the feedback to make a difference. And when those characteristics are there, then outcomes appear to improve. That's uh, interesting because what what I um, what I like from uh, one thing that I like from from fit is that in a way it's um, it, it's paradoxical, but it transform the therapy in a more um, dialogical um, mm. um, uh, thing, you know, because um, I remember uh, an article of the Shazer and Kimberg, in Kimberg, uh, um, 1992, I think, it's uh, therapy apostrophal reviews, something like that, and they start uh, saying something like, uh, uh, it's very strange because therapy, it's about talking, but very few kind of therapies um, think about how we talk during therapy, the thing yeah. I say. And uh, it seems that in a way, ter- fits um, help us to transform um, or to put our attention in the dialogical circle that we have to create with the, the client. Mm. I'm not the expert, mm. I, I don't uh, put my hand on you and make the therapy, but we, con- we um, construct this together. Um, mm. Two last question. Uh, mm. One is about brief therapy. Uh, I, I remember um, a chapter in, in a book of Jeff Zeig, a chapter by Jay Halley. And Jay Halley said something like, um, you need to be trained to uh, make therapy longer, something like that. Uh, it means that if you um, learn a method that um, brings you and your client to have a very long therapy, you will have a very long therapy. Uh, normally, therapy are, are briefer than psychoanalysis or other kind of therapies. Um, but with fit, and with what we know about the liberal practice, uh, does it still make sense to talk about brief therapy? So, Jay Haley and the work of strategic therapists, and I think even to a certain degree, the work we did at Brief Family Therapy Center on Solution Focused Therapy, all have to be viewed in context. And uh, because context often drives the conversation. And at that particular time, the dominant idea was doing therapy long term was the best practice. That's where the real change happened. And we had lots of ideas about that supported that. For example, short term therapies encourage a flight into health. Um, and But here's the big recognition I had once I started to look at the data, and especially with regard to this debate between brief or, or long term. If you look at the data, going all the way back to the early 1940s, and ask what was the average number of visits people saw a mental health professional in the 1940s, the average number of visits was 4.3. So you have the theory, we should do long-term therapy, and you have its this uh, contrarian partner, whoa, we should do treatment as brief as possible, all fighting what is largely, in my opinion, an ideological battle disconnected from reality. All therapy from the beginning in modern mental health has been relatively short, 4.3 4.3 sessions. Right now, in non-commercial populations, the average number of sessions is about five or six. 90% of cases in America are finished in 20 sessions or less. So where, where is long-term therapy? It's in the minds of theoreticians and practitioners. Once you embrace the reality that all treatment is relatively short, you, you can work within those parameters. 
the modal number of times, that is the most frequent number of times people see a therapist is one. It's always been one. So when we were saying back in the late 1980s, we have more single session cures, we were boasting about something or taking credit for something that had always been the case. But we didn't know that. Our, our lack of knowledge on, in retrospect is, is, is embarrassing, really. When people ask me today about long and short therapies or long and brief therapies, I often say, can you imagine a surgeon asking that? Let's say you need heart surgery. And the surgeon came in and said, well, would you like the long surgery or the brief surgery? I think most people would be absolutely confused by that. I think it's a silly distinction that exists in theory only. Because what the customer is concerned about is the effect. If a surgeon said that to me, I would say, I want the most effective surgery. And in order to do that, I have to find out how much do you need? And the parameters are relatively brief. But in many cases, more is better than less for that person. And in all cases, when treatment isn't working, briefer is better. With you, briefer is better. This client may need something else or somebody else to help them. So I don't think the distinction between brief and long-term is um, borne out by the research, and I don't think it's useful. I think it's a distinction without difference. Potatoes or spuds, it's all potatoes, it's all starch, it has the exact same effect on the body. I don't, I don't really understand the distinction any longer. And by monitoring, we can find out how much does that person need and when they've had enough of me and maybe need something else. I'm just a little concerned because I have to publish this interview on my channel on YouTube, mm. that is Flavio Canistra Brief Therapy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think brief therapy as, as an idea and the strategies that are associated with it, I think are, are, are fine. I think that main commitment needs to be to the outcome. And this is actually what I took away from my time in kindergarten as a researcher with solution-focused brief therapy, that what was really important was did the client get what they came for? And so if as brief or strategic or whatever therapist you are, you can shift your mindset to the results, are you getting what you came for? Well, then, then I think we'll be okay and we don't need to fight over them whenever you talk like this it's a little bit like saying the pope is not infallible and people get all upset and feel attacked um, but if you've traveled the world you know that there are many spiritual traditions that can help people and it doesn't have anything to do with the goodness, rightness, or wrongness of what the Pope might say. Despite the names, I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah, you know, it's true, it's true. I, in some videos, I, um, I, I, I said, uh, while I, I'm here talking about uh, single session therapy, I traveled the world to talk about single session therapy, but um, here I said, uh, if then we will have something better or if i find something better i don't care the name i don't care single session therapy uh, what is important is that it is effective um yeah well okay um i canceled this interview well it's a stop <laughs> no, i have the last the last question which is very important to me and very special for this moment because uh, <clears throat> i do this there's a last question uh, in every interview I do, and um, your work inspired me. This, 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 uh, this last question, and um, here it is. And now you will find why. Um, suppose that you have to give an advertise um, a suggestion. Sorry, uh, to to a young psychologist. Oh, not so young. Um, 
and you want to suggest to him or her an exercise that he can practice in during his common life, there is in his days, that can be helpful for him or her in uh, their uh, private practice as psychologists. What could be this, this suggestion? Well, I would, I would say, say if you, if want, you want to improve, improve you, you need to know what your baseline, baseline performance is. is. And the, and the only, only way, way to do that, that is to measure, measure and find, find out. out. So, so if, if there, there was, was a suggestion about eventually becoming more effective, effective it, would it would be about figuring out how effective you are right now, now. So, so that any, any adjustments will be able to see does it improve, it improve your results. results. If, if I, don't I don't have any, any other information, information about, about the person and they, they push, push me really hard, hard then, then I would say, I'm a, I'm a guy who plays, who plays the base, base race. race. There, there are long shots, shots when you're, when you're placing, placing a bet, bet the, the horse that's, that's running with 100 to 1 odds, odds and, and there, there are more sure bets, bets 2 to 1, 1 to 1. one, to one. And, and I'm, I'm going to bet, bet on, on the factors, factors that contribute the most to treatment outcome. And, and so if, if any therapist, therapist young, young or old, came, came to me and said, I don't know what to work on, I would say, since you don't have a baseline, that we, we can, can figure, figure out what specifically you need to learn to push, to push your performance, performance to the next level, level. Then, then I think, I think improving, improving your ability to respond empathically is probably, is probably the best place to invest, to invest your time, not, not knowing anything, anything about you. you. Therapists believe that their, that their empathic abilities improve with time. time. They, they do not. not. Therapists, Therapists believe, believe they're, they're equally, equally empathic to all clients. clients. They, they are not. not. And, so and so I have, I have to find out when, when your empathic abilities, that, that is, the ability to convey to the, to the client that, that I understand and I get you, which, which is in and, in and of itself, itself a healing, healing practice. practice. People who feel, feel understood, understood, doors, doors open, open to them. I can move on. on. I can, that's, that's probably where I would say to invest your time. That's fantastic. Scott, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure, Flavio. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and um, I'll see you in the next training. That'd be great. Look forward to it. And any of your colleagues, always welcome. Thank you. <laughs>